every single military across the planet requires some kind of support structure. And that support structure could involve many components, but usually it relates to logistics, intelligence services, or you could say maybe information collection. Um, logistics, of course, would relate to supplies. And then perhaps any other auxiliary or other requirements. But generally, when it comes down to it, most militaries require a support structure that relates to equipment. The ability to uh, arm, as it were, your military. However, the support structure that we're going to talk about in this video is a little bit different. And it is, however, a support structure for the same purpose as any support structure of a military regardless of whether they term it that or not. But as we'll find, they do in fact term it in that way. So this is called multi-tiered support systems. And interestingly, they don't actually revolve around the conventional idea of support systems for a military. Here you get a short video talking about support teams and in it, they use a variety of coded language. However, a lot of these things can be found in military manuals, as far as what they're talking about. With the difference being that this structure, they're talking about students, and the multi-tiered support systems are based out of control of children and students mainly and it's sort of like the Trojan horse idea but this goes on a little bit further than that and this is carried out by support uh, state support teams or SSTs and the job of these people is to provide a support infrastructure for overt military occupation leveraging the control of children uh, inherently ignorant of these concepts as their foundation if you will so here we look at a flyer or pamphlet uh, whatever you want to call it it's a sort of like an online graphic and the stuff looks, um, relatively speaking, uh, innocent, right? You've got the Apple symbol there, and this is for the state of Ohio, state support team region five. And here it states empowering teams and elevating outcomes. Sufficiently vague, of course. State support team region five will be hosting teams interested in empowering their teams to elevate each child's outcomes. So this, of course, is going to be talking about school and school resources and talk about schools in general. There is no, in this pamphlet anyway, direct correlation between this and a support structure for military. But I would point out that their idea is to empower teams and uh, uh, <clears throat> they have a check mark over what looks to be like a bullseye target and this is a pamphlet is mostly colored in red and white <clears throat> so those are some elements to notice here so let's go ahead and look further into what these support structure or these support systems really are here it states rti versus mtss some people interpret mtss as a newer enhanced version of rti in this line of thought, while RTI and MTSS are both multi-tiered approaches, the MTSS framework also functions as a continuous school improvement model. MTSS encourages educators to examine district, campus, and classroom systems and culture through the review and analyzation, or um, yeah, now analyzing of data on all students and identify students who need additional supports to maximize their potential. Now here it states adult, all students, and it references, of course, the, um, campus and classroom and district. 
So the district would be your sort of governmental control overview in which they collect data on everyone, including parents or quote unquote adult learners. The campus would be your colleges, of course, your universities, etc., and uh, possibly uh, other components as well. And then, of course, the classroom would usually relate to the regular thing that people think of as school. So it's not just about the improvement of the system, but it's also about the review and analyzation of data collected through these mechanisms. Those are some things to be to notice uh, of import importance. Uh, this the rest of this is essentially not important. That just gives you a general idea of what they're talking about when they refer to MTSS or RTI. They're talking about their support system for data collection and analysis, basically. So here we read a little bit further. We have context and purpose, MTSS vision. Every student, right, that's every, every student, will receive the educational support needed to grow and achieve at a higher level. Well, that could mean many things. But the important thing to notice here is that all of these things are going to be designed so that they appear to be supporting students, quote unquote. But the actual overall structure is not designed to support students. It's actually designed to support military occupation, overt military occupation. MTSS mission to support SAISD five-year goals by implementing and sustaining a multi-tiered system of support that fosters a problem-solving culture, integrating assessment, data-based decision-making, and intervention in a continuous cycle designed to maximize the educational opportunities of all students. So notice what they're saying that they're going to do here. Five-year goals integrating assessment, data-based decision-making, those are like command-level decisions you'd find in any military, and intervention, or you would call maybe an operation. MTSS principles, there are five essential principles that guide MTSS framework and SAISD. Corrective responsibility, or collective responsibility, every SAISD stakeholder believes that all students deserve and have the ability to learn at a high level, assumes responsibility for ensuring that each student learns at a high level. So here, they're declaring the assumption of responsibility. I don't think that could be really any clearer, but we'll read on and get more understanding of what we're looking at here. So here's their big colored pyramid, and what you have three tiers with red, yellow and green just like the colors on a traffic light green go yellow yield and red is stop and here uh, they have two categories behavior and academics slash speech and we don't have to read through this whole thing but we'll look at some of the listed parts here we have under academics and speech progress monitor weekly um, interventions provided daily research or evidence-based interventions and then we have uh, in the yellow the words targeted and standardized more intervention research evidence-based interventions progress monitoring review and analysis of data uh, and then on the green under academics and speech category, we have whole group, small group, universal and core instruction. So, of course, we get our, our universal words here because we also have universal screener and benchmark data collected. There you've got those words included there, which relate to other things as well. And on the other side, you have similar word usage. So now we're going to go ahead and look at a document, uh, an example of this concept, 
and how it's being implemented from the Marysville Exempted Village School District Tier 3 Stakeholder Meeting. Here it has listings or categories, child's name, student ID, grade school, building date of meeting, and attendees. So one, one, ha one has to wonder what child's name and student ID category would be filled in, considering this is the stakeholder meeting and the grade. The school building and date of meeting would also be, uh, well, those wouldn't be as important, but then you have attendees. So the question would be at the stakeholder meeting, do they have one of these sheets on every student at the school? And do they fill out each one with all the information or do they just leave child name, student ID, and grade blank? So those are the practical questions anyway. But here it also it shows interventions, frequency, duration, provider, and outcome in the uh, intervention history. So from here we understand that the incentivization of intervention is being provided to the faculty. So one way you can think about it is that faculty people, say teachers, uh, counselors, um, well, it doesn't really matter what their position is, they have a financial incentive, possibly for bonuses, for promotion, for whatever, to make these interventions because whoever is making the interventions, the provider as it says, their name will be put on the documents stakeholders are going to be looking at, which means that the stakeholders, which are not parents by the way, will determine who is doing more interventions. It's kind of like a quota system, I guess, if you want to think about it like that. You have a certain quota of interventions that you're supposed to meet. So of course we should find out what exactly these interventions are. Because on this sheet, it doesn't really specify what exactly an intervention really is. But the categories here is problem identification. So this is obviously coming from the idea that there's a problem. Problem specification, brainstorm, implementation variable. Now the next part of this sheet has an action plan. Who does what by when? So that's particularly um, interesting. Uh, I guess there's probably a lot of people that would still might look at this and say, oh no, that's perfectly normal absolutely innocent. They're just doing their jobs or all the other dismissive ways that somebody can say that what you're talking about is not true even though it's clearly true. But at the bottom we have printed name, signature, and date. Of course I don't know exactly who would be signing there if that would be those listed under the category of attendees for the stakeholder meeting. Really just hard to say. So now we come to MEVSD, Student Risk Screening Scale, SRSS-IE Guidance Document. So now we're going to get start looking at what we might be thinking of or what they might be talking about when it comes to interventions. What does the SRSS-IE measure? Externalizing behavior clusters and internalizing behavior clusters. It, usually people do not talk like this. This is what you would look at and say, this is coded language. It's evidence of military operation. They don't want, they want their operatives to know what they're doing and what's going on, but they don't want everyone else to, and thus they speak in code. So under externalizing behavior clusters, we have steal, lie, cheat, sneak, behavior problems, peer rejection, low academic achievement, negative attitude, and aggressive, and under internalizing behavior clusters, we have emotionally flat, whatever that means, shy, withdrawn, sad, depressed, anxious, and lonely. So this document normally, on the face of it, would look like they're talking about uh, interventions against quote-unquote mental health. And then here down at the bottom, we have domain externalizing E7 and internalizing I5 low risk, moderate risk, and high risk. So that's kind of interesting. But as far as this sheet goes, it would it's a lot more meticulous to decode or pick through it, whereas other examples are far more obvious. Now probably of all the forms, the worst that you could see 
or the most damning, I suppose, whichever way you want to look at it. This would be the adverse adverse childhood experience or ACE questionnaire, finding your ACE score. Now, it starts out with while you were growing up during your first 18 years of life. This document would not be presented, however, to an adult. This is a document that you will find under the MTSS, the operation, as it were, the support systems. It looks like a document that you would present to an adult because it says during your first 18 years of life, thinking, of course, that this means that the person has achieved 18 years of life. But that is not what it's saying because someone might not have achieved the first 18 years of life. That does not mean that they are not currently in the first 18 years of their life. This document, like all of the other ones that we're going, the rest of the other ones that we're going to be looking at, this is part of something that's given to learners of all ages, right, in their system, their MTSS structure. Now, this document specifically relates to leveraging children and family members as a spy mechanism. And it's part of the idea of Project MK Ultra, getting somebody to spy and report on things without them knowing that that's what they're doing. And some of the questions in here are very disturbing, but I just think it's important to notice the overall tone and perspective that this document has. The first question is, did a parent or other adult in the household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt? Yes, no, if yes, enter one. Did a parent or other adult in the household often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you, ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? If yes, enter one. Now, this, these, of course, are very obviously fishing questions. Did an adult or person at least five years older than you ever touch, fondle? Well, notice, of course, this question. Did an adult or person at least five years older? They're, they're putting the bar down at five years, right? Which is very weird. Then you ever touch or fondle you or have you touch their body in a sexual way or try to or actually have oral, anal, or vaginal sex with you? Now imagine, of course, giving this to a child. Not to mention, what, why are they listing it? Why is the mark at five years? Because usually pedophilia, the benchmark is at 18. That's when you become an adult, right? In some cases, they've apparently dropped that down to 16, but five years? I've never, never heard of that. So that's obviously a really weird and disturbing question. Did you often feel that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special or your family didn't look out for each other, feel close to each other or support each other? And I, I don't really need to read the rest of these questions. You probably get the idea. But the important thing to notice here is that these are fishing questions. These are essentially speaking, getting somebody to rat under false pretenses, as it were. And it's not for any sort of quote-unquote protection, as far as we would think, but rather it's to identify points of susceptibility, right? So which children would be easiest to remove and traffic somewhere without anybody paying attention or caring? Which individuals in the community are most likely to fight back against a military operation and from these questions, they can identify and collect data which will lead to military decisions of who to target in a community, who to basically kill, or who needs to be quote-unquote retrained, and who are more likely to be compliant. And then, of course, also which children are much easier to grab up and take from their parents, etc. That's what this type of document is doing. It's a data collection for their military operations and part of the idea of Project MKUltra. So this is one particular component. This is what you would call intelligence gathering. And this is done through the idea of human intelligence, 
whereas you're working with humans rather than some other format like signals, pictures, etc. Right? This is a a thing where you collect information by word of mouth. So that is usually considered human intelligence. So what the purpose of this document is for is not what you would think. It is far more insidious than that. And it is designed to collect information with regard to military operations. Now our next document that we're going to look at, also from the Marysville exempt, well that other document wasn't necessarily from Marysville, but this is also the Marysville exempted village school district like the one we previously looked at. And this is planning and placement team role and functions. We have assessment, planning, and placement. So we have under methods, you've got different uh, forms and things to fill out, but under purpose, you have more coded language, right? You have to provide assistance and guidance to building teams and development and coordination of student behavioral intervention planning. You have build data team capacity for completing and executing low acuity behavioral intervention planning, analyze and assess student treatment outcomes. And of course, these are all written in very, and not, not plain language, right? They would never come out and say, we are collecting information through leveraging or control of children as um, the support for military operations, right? They would never say that. <laughs> Next, we have the MESVD parent FBA questionnaire. This is for Maryville Exempted Village School District. And we'll notice that the child's name and grade are listed as from the stakeholder meeting document. But then we have school building form completed by relationship to student end date completed. Now, the other thing to notice here is that if they want to, they can make all of this paperwork and they can fill it out fraudulently if they desire to target someone specifically and state that uh, your child did all this or that when they never did or that you did or that you might not even know. They might just uh, use phony evidence to um, orchestrate attacks against you that you don't really see happening around you, right? So there's a lot of uses, the ways they can leverage these forms, as it were. Here it states, describe your child's strengths and positive qualities. So far, so good, right? Then the next one is describe in your own words what the problem behavior seems to be. So that's obviously coming from the idea that there's a problem behavior. And then you have, why do you think your child is showing this behavior, and blah, blah, blah. So, this is getting uh, cooperation from parents, but again, it has to do with data co collection and analysis, um, intelligence gathering operations, and work. And um, there's also another idea when it comes to human intelligence, where if you want somebody to be co cooperative, first you develop the hab habit or habits uh, of cooperation. And one way to do that is by giving people small tasks and gradually building them up to the real task that you want them to perform. Because at that point, they're too involved usually to back out. Some other interesting questions on this parental form is, um, is there anything that makes the behavior worse that school personnel should avoid doing? Have there been any changes that your child experienced lately? Uh, sleeping habits, medications, eating habits, uh, essentially how to get your child to calm down. Uh, and then if the child has had any mental health or counseling services. Now, of course, most people look at this and say, well, these are all just standard questions you'd find on any forum anywhere you go. That's not entirely true. And the medical industry does this stuff for the same reason. It's to collect information or intelligence gathering, which they can leverage, in fact, against you and everybody else in the community. It's not for your benefit, essentially. And here you've got, how do you think your child gets along with other students at or, or at school, at home or at school? 
What areas do you think your child needs extra help or support at school? What is your child's attitudes towards school? Who are the adults who provide additional support to your child and family? Okay. These are very important. These last two. All of the other ones are specific about points of contention or places of that can be targeted, right? Like sleeping habits, medication, things like that. Uh, how and in which ways they could say slip chemicals or something else into uh, whatever, you know, give somebody like an overdose, death, death by natural causes, those types of things, right? The, the really bad ones, of course, the more mundane would be just maybe giving a, some drugging operation to make people more agitated, etc. These last two here, they have to do with overall perspective in the community toward the enemy occupation, which is the reason why they ask child's attitude towards school. That's a weird one. See, they're not asking about anything specific. They're asking how the child views the concept of school. Anybody who is antagonistic or believes that school is anything but a sanctified holy ground in which uh, all members involved in that institution can do no harm, can are above the law, essentially. Anyone who has any viewpoint that deviates from that is going to be an enemy. That's a sign of, of uh, enemy. Now, the adults that provide additional support, that is asking for information that will pro provide an outside target source. So, if you had attorneys or counselors or essentially anybody um, providing additional support, all of those people can be leveraged against the child and the family. So, those are very serious and, and, to me anyway, obvious implication of what they're trying to do on this document. Next we have the MEVSD ABC observation checklist. Uh, and here it's got domain indicators and then various things here with behavior, something called antecedent and then consequence. Under the consequence section, I would like to highlight three or four, actually, areas. First one is detention assigned. A detainee is the word generally ascribed to a prisoner or somebody in the Department of Corrections. They are detained. Now, below that, we have physical assist. I don't think you could word that in any other creepier way. We all know what physical assist means. And then we have physical escort and physical management. I mean, who on earth would want to put their child in a place that physic manages someone physically? That's kind of disturbing, right? And here also we have... Um, two more sections and they all list out the same consequences detention physical assist physical escort physical management of course with probably with most children in the school system um those things do not apply to them this is probably done to the ones where the school support structure the mtss or whatever you want to call it but then again it's multi-tiered so it may not entirely involve school but either way in this scenario, or in, with what we're talking about, this these things would probably be only done to those where no one cares about them and they can get away with it. So I would, of course, reference to those earlier documents. Those earlier documents tell the faculty, the people, the operators, if you will, to what extent they can get away with these activities. Naturally, if you have a home environment in which the parents are always fighting each other, 
and they work all day, <clears throat> multiple jobs, they don't have much attention that they can give to the child. So practically, these individuals can get away with a lot in relation to physical management of such a child because the parents won't notice. Of course, if they're an orphan, they can get away with whatever they want. And nobody will do anything about it. Now, this next document is called Data Team Meeting Agenda from the same example. But, as I, I, should, I should probably state that this does not have to do with this one place. This is happening everywhere. Under purpose, it states, identify students who need additional instruction and intervention support. That intervention supports, of course. Additional instruction, most people would understand that as uh, extra time given to whatnot, or whatever. Intervention supports, now that is what, you're, what we were talking about before, the ultimate implications. That is a word generally vague enough that most people can write that off or explain it away in their minds. And if they can't do it, then they'll ask about it. And then, of course, the uh, support teams will give some sort of vague response as a way to handle the situation and not tell what they're actually doing. So the only real way to know what they're doing is to research it and divine it and understand these are foreign adversaries. They are not your friends. You know, they're not here to help you. They're here to leverage anything that you provide them and anything that they can extort against you. And here it states, develop tier two and tier three intervention plans. Develop an action plan to support core instruction. Outcome, tier two and tier three intervention plans, blah, blah, blah. So that's about the most useful stuff on this page anyway. And now, we've got, of course, got these different sections here. Um, here you've got a uh, focus question, how, we can, how can we support these students during core instruction? Uh, and, of course, it's just more talking code. And on the face of it, none of these things would actually appear to be what, they're, what they really are. The only time that you'll find out what these things really are for is when they use them use the information gained for decision based actions right here we've got uh, some more categories that are kind of interesting we have student intervention plans student name tier intervention interventionist frequency so these documents might not be related to the stakeholders, but the stakeholders are the ones that determine who gets paid what, right? And so we find uh, different wording on the stakeholder documents, but they're essentially speaking, uh, talking about the same thing. And then this has the winter data team meeting, so they've, they've got this broken out based off of the seasons you would find in any school season or uh, school uh, period, whatever, I don't remember what's called, school year because the school year is not the quote-unquote calendar year. Uh, and you have essentially the same questions as one for the fall. Next we have the Functional Behavior Assessment Questionnaire. And this first page has mostly blank spaces, but here it states, please briefly describe your, or brief, Please briefly describe the primary behavior of concern that is impacting the student's school performance and functioning. Now, it's important to note that these, all of these things are about building out files, and those files will be then retained in the system. A lot of the individuals collecting this information may or not know the full implications of what they're doing, just like any compartmentalized unit. Anybody in any military structure performing operations of intelligence collection may not know for what purpose what they're collecting will be used. They simply do it because they're told to by those that are paying them to do it, right? Those that control their salary. That is how most compartmentalized structures work. And this is no exception. So you won't get anywhere by going after the individuals actually doing the collection, say teachers, faculty at the school thing because 
they might not actually know what this stuff is going to be used for. Of course, they don't really care. They are the individuals behind them that are getting them to do this type of collection that then intend to leverage the information for other purposes. On this sheet, we have uh, what I'm sure many have seen before. Uh, we've got like the zero through six scoring category. And then interestingly enough, the last two questions state, if the student engages in the problem behavior, do peers stop interacting with the student? That of course would mean that, is it effective enough to, does it work essentially to get uh, somebody who's doing something you don't want them to do to be ostracized? Is, is that working? Also, are they essentially poisoning our stock with ideas that we don't want them following, right? So, the usual, right? This is not geared towards the idea that bullying is bad. They don't ever actually technically say that, as far as I'm aware. This is the idea of watching and seeing whether or not the other students are doing what they're trained to do, which is reject anything uh, that might impact their brainwashing, right? And then naturally uh, force compliance into the, uh, well, it's not exactly the idea of force compliance, it's that um, the other child will have to if they want to, you know, have friends or socialize or blah, 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 they will have to conform to what the other group does. So that's leveraging ostracization to change behavior. So that's what that section's particularly about. And I think a lot of people are aware of that nowadays. Also, it states, is the problem behavior more likely to occur following unscheduled events or disruption in classroom routines? And there it basically states, plain as day in black and white, what I just said. About what their focus is on and its control over students which does not mean just children but mostly refers to children now we also have another checklist uh, with the scoring of zero through six this is called setting events checklist and of course these first questions are just like the other ones they're all fairly mundane, what you would usually expect from these kinds of forms. Just as with the other one, the last questions on this form are the real ones that they're looking at. So number 25 is, does the student seem angry before or during the occurrence of this behavior? And then 24, just above it, is do other students seem intimidated by this behavior? So that, of course, is them looking at it and saying, is this person going to be an adversary? And like I said, this doesn't necessarily have to do with children. But if it is a child, then they're probably thinking, okay, so the parents are probably in some way or another uh, aggressive, maybe. That, that might be a way they would look at it. And they would, of course, term it an aggressor. Most of the time, we are trained that aggressiveness is wrong it's um, a problem behavior that needs to be fixed when you use wording from these documents and that's because if you are a military occupation you want to make sure people are compliant not aggressive and that should be obvious and then of course here's more questions uh, this one's the motivation assessment scale again like the others zero through six or in as with the other ones down at the bottom um, we will look at the more impactful of the questions they're asking. 15, does this person seem to do the behavior to get you to spend some time with him or her? 16, does the behavior seem to occur when this person has been told that he or she can't do something B or she had wanted to do? He or she had wanted to. So those, of course, that second one's very convoluted. But this is identifying who is a likely or possible op oppositional spy or uh, intelligence operative type of person, right? 
somebody who's a little bit more aware than others and is a little bit more tactful and strategic when it comes to their responses. This would be a category that's very important for them to pay attention to because those, generally speaking, are the biggest problems to any military occupation. The individuals who can operate covertly. And that is what these questions are designed to identify. Now we have problem behavior score sheet, which is set up a slightly different, and all of these documents are all set up a little bit different to look like they're doing different things, but they're really all designed around the same purpose. Um, we have peer and adults, so this is going to relate to children. And then we have escape attention, escape attention. And it, the pattern of wording here is, um, I think, uh, indicative of what they're doing. Now this other section on this uh, document is setting events checklist score sheet. And here we've got words like task avoidance, attention-peer, attention-teacher, tangible slash activity, and other. So all of these things are designed to be to appear anyway on their surface mundane, but they are all definitely designed from the perspective of somebody you might find at, say, the CIA or some other human intelligence activity type of outfit. You know, how to get people to do something you want without them really knowing what the purpose behind what you're getting them to do actually is. Getting somebody to assassinate somebody without them realizing that you put them up to it or getting somebody to share you actionable military information without them knowing that they're essentially spying and selling out not only themselves, but their neighbors as well. Now also notice on the motivation assessment scale score sheet, we have a similar uh, listing out of, of the same kinds of words, sensory, escape, attention, tangible. Those are some pretty loaded word usage patterns there. Next we have the behavioral intervention guidance. We have triple deficit, SRSS, double deficit, combined and double deficit, and single deficit. So then we have the criteria category. Under triple, we, triple deficit, we have high end or moderate risk in both the externalizing and internalizing domains of SRSS and high or moderate red or yellow in office referrals. Uh, that's, uh, that's not written by somebody who's trying to make it clear what they're actually doing. Uh, then we have intervention placed in intervention group, zones of regulation copying cat and or skills group and coordinate classroom behavior plan and referred for supplemental community support that is your key line there supplemental community support and of course this is for the triple deficit this is like the uh the bad juju stuff for them single deficit is uh more of your mundane so you know, the usual. So behavior interventions, we'll look at some of the behaviors that they have. We have active refusal to work, verbal refusal, materials pushed away, and an active body response. Non-compliance, right? That's a big one. But everything that this stuff is about is enforcing compliance and control mechanisms, right? It's it, You have a lot of the, these things that are all about designed uh, to collect intelligence and information without that person knowing they're actually providing information to enemies. But these uh, also have to do with the idea of enforcing compliance through threat of, well, the idea, enforce, enforce compliance, right? Forcing somebody to comply, which therefore wouldn't be compliance, actually. It would just be forcing somebody to do something but they like to use the word non-compliance because it sounds nicer than do what I say or else, you know. Uh, then, of course, we've got the usual ones, right? Verbal defiance contains possibly the largest section on this list. They, and that, that tells you exactly, 
exactly why individuals in the school system, whenever you do something they don't like, they turn extremely vicious. And then they blame everything from you to everyone else, and all of their brainwashed minions will then turn around and blame the, uh, the appointed cause, anyway. They despise being defied. Hence why verbal defiance is a behavioral problem of such significance on this list. Next, we have hyperactivity and fidgeting, invasion of personal space, impulsivity perhaps dominates the most on this section of the document. And then we have pacing, emotional pacing, or self-regulatory pacing. And this last part, which relates to pacing, uh, we've got some, not, most of this is not really that interesting, but then you have one part that states, incorporate heavy work opportunities throughout day. Now, I don't know about you, but heavy work opportunities sounds quite a lot like hard labor, which they would do, of course, to prison inmates or those in the Department of Corrections, as though those names aren't creepy themselves. And you also have this last part, which uses the words escalating or de-escalating. Those words usually are used in reference to the use of force. Now, under the support teams for this covert, anyway, in most ways covert, uh, military support operation, we have state support teams. Surprisingly enough, there's not actually that many individuals involved in this stuff. You're Faculty members, mostly, like I said before, they would just be low-level workers who are incentivized to do this. They don't care about what the information that they're doing is going to be collected for. They probably don't notice any anything wrong with it. And they're not the ones that are going to be leveraging it. The ones above them that will be leveraging this information will be your state support team director. And in Ohio, specifically, there are 16 Interestingly enough, these documents of who the directors are are signed, but their names are not printed out. That means that if they sign their name in a particular way, you may not be able to read who they actually are. Most forms have your name printed and signed, not just signed. That's because these forms are not designed for public use. But it just so happens that we can get our hands on these forms right now, anyway. The state team director for number one, all I can really tell for certain is that the last name is McGahan, or M-C-K-A-H-A-N. But I also can't be sure of that because the name itself is not actually typed out. And here I will show all the rest of these documents, but... Just like the first one, most of them are only written out in cursive as a signature and not actually printed, which makes means that you have to do some uh, extrapolation, some analysis to decipher who these individuals actually are. But on all of these, you have the state support team director. Then you have the Ohio Department of Education Office for Improvement and Innovation Director, Ohio Department of Education Office for Exceptional Children Director, and you probably get the idea here. These individuals are all hiding among the masses, as it were, but they are, as I would expect, your overt or your covert foreign operatives that know exactly what they're doing. Now, you might be asking, what is this support for? Well, basically, intervention and occupation by UN forces. <clears throat> Not exactly the kind of military lockdown, uh, basically, occupation or martial law that most people are thinking. Most people are thinking of U.S. armed forces, maybe National Guard, something like that, being used to set up red roadblocks, checkpoints, whatnot. Now, the other idea here is that the United Nations Intervention Force would essentially speaking be 
baby foreigners, foreign conventional military, say from Europe, who are then, or, you know, maybe Asia, who are then flown in on planes and all their equipment dropped off and whatnot. That is an inaccurate understanding of the situation. As we will see, the UN intervention is not only already going on, but all of the forces, mechanisms, and infrastructure is, essentially speaking, already here. This is not just relegated to the United States, of course. This has been going on for a long time in other places. It just hasn't quite overtly happened here yet. But this is a universal or universalist operation. Our mission or occupation, whatever you want to call it. And that's the reason why they have so many references in the use of the word universal, university, universal church, etc. Because it all links back to the same thing. And then the UN, of course, is also universal. Now here we're going to watch a video to get an idea of how the UN forces operate under a video titled, What is United Nations Peacekeeping? And of course, they always form things under the guise of one word or another. They always frame things a certain way, and then they repeat that message everywhere so that there can be no um, denying it, right? Because it's not about what the truth is, it's about how much you repeat the same thing over and over again, and whether or not you claim something under a certain cover, whether or not you appear to be doing that. And of course, we see in this video all of the UN peacekeepers in Africa, military style, I guess you would say, right? The appearance of military. I mean, one has to wonder exactly how professional they are, but they all wear the blue cover. Either that could be a helmet, it could be a beret, it could be a hat, doesn't matter long as they're wearing the UN blue on their head. That is the universal signal, so to speak, of UN peacekeep. And it's not exactly about who is doing what. It's not about exactly what training they have or whatnot. It's all about the image, the appearance of the thing. They leverage fraud across the board, which is, of course, why they're called peacekeepers right? It's fraud. They leverage lying. And they leverage uh, psychological operations. But when we recognize that the support structure is built around children, we really understand why they've been so effective. Being able to leverage the control of children to essentially get their way to um, establish control over an area. And so you see all sorts of different kinds of UN peacekeepers. Uh, and different types in this video alone. Various uniforms around the world, various types, various infrastructure and organization. They're not all, you know, militaristic and in the videos, the propaganda videos, just like any propaganda video, they always try to show themselves doing good and whatnot. But make no mistake that these are occupation forces who will use any means necessary whatsoever to control the area on behalf of universalist interests to essentially stamp all over the uh, the idea of individual, state, or national sovereignty. It doesn't matter. You are essentially, as the saying comes from um, Star Trek, uh, resistance is futile. And it's we've, of course, seen this stuff everywhere. But the important thing to think about is that UN intervention forces are derived from the individuals within the country that they are occupying. They are not brought in. Well, they can be, right? And UN forces can be made up of drug addicts, criminals. doesn't honestly matter, just as long as they're willing to put on the uniform, carry a gun, and threaten their neighbors under the flag of the United Nations wearing the blue hat or helmet. Now we all know what units in the United States specifically are likely to do that. The drug dealing law enforcement, so-called, the street gangs, and of course, school faculty members.
And this brings us to our next bit, which is a short clip from a video about the Chicago police specifically training for the Democratic National Convention. I'm sure you'll notice very strong similarities between this video and the last one that we watched about the operations of the United Nations. Just in the picture alone, you can see the strong implications there. Now, I do expect that across the board and all over the country in the United States, this stuff's going to become more and more apparent as they roll this stuff out in everyone's face because that is, it appears anyway, it's not being stopped. It's in fact uh, completely and fully supported and mechanized at this point. And of course, this is a long, drawn out process. They do not do this overnight. And they have done this, they have not done this overnight in any country across the planet. But so it would appear they have been effective in most places they've been in. At least that's what they would want you to think anyway. So from this video, we see all sorts of different types of people, fat guys, skinny guys, doesn't matter. But they are, there's a couple people in this video, essentially. I mean, it's not that large of a force, but they are showing a much similar pattern in this video about the Chicago Police Department that we saw in the video on the UN operations. So very soon they will likely eventually drop the veil entirely and just simply be United Nations peacekeepers. They will no longer say that they're state police, that they're federal police, that they're city municipal police. They will simply state they are UN peacekeepers, right? So, of course, they're going to need a reason to do this, some sort of catalyst, which we'll get into in a minute. But at this time, it's very obvious what they're doing here is that they're slow rolling out. Well, it's pretty quick, actually, but they're quickly moving on the intent to establish overt military martial law under United Nations peacekeeping intervention cover, the hospice, right? Their support mechanism will come from the school, strong and immense school system. The enforcement mechanism will come from a mixture of phony law enforcement, uh, street gangs all linked together, all wearing the same uniforms, uh, various propagandists, of course, and then naturally they will also include drug addicts, and in fact many of them will be foreign, but most of them won't be. The whole idea of fear of foreign and in foreign invasion is so that you don't realize that the invasion already happened and that we are already under, essentially speaking, universal control, and that there's a lot, a lot of people in our own personal communities who have lived here for a long time, and they are complicit. So let's look into this a little bit further. Uh, the Wikipedia article on humanitarian intervention says, humanitarian intervention is the use of threat or military force by a state or states across borders with the intent of ending severe and widespread human rights violations in a state where it is not given permission for the use of force. Of course, they are the ones behind all of the quote unquote human rights violations to give themselves an excuse to do this. So they can of course then do more human rights violations and then have the ability to unilaterally say that they're not violating anyone's rights because nobody has any rights anymore, essentially. Or they stipulate what's, what rights people have. That's their game to play. Anyway, humanitarian interventions are aimed at ending human rights violations of individuals other than the citizens of the intervening state. Humanitarian interventions are only intended to prevent human rights violations in extreme circumstances. Wasn't that nice? Attempts to establish institutions and political systems to achieve positive outcomes in a medium to long range, such as peacekeeping, peace building, and developmental or development aid, do not fall under this definition of humanitarian intervention. Oh, well, that's interesting. So they could do peacekeeping and not call it intervention, even though it is an intervention, right? But either way, uh, we see, of course, the word game that they're playing and the fact that there's only one perspective that you're allowed to have on any of the internet uh, platforms right now because they're all controlled by the same individuals who are intending to do the operation that we, we're, um, well, we, we really know what they're doing, right? They're, they're the atrocious operation that they want to inflict. This is not one standard or a legal definition of humanitarian intervention. Field of analysis, such as law, ethics, politics, often influences the definition that is chosen. 
differences in definition include variations. The way the humanitarian intervention is limited to instances where there is an absence of consent from the host state. Of course, this has nothing to do about the people because they actually don't really care about humans except they want to eliminate and eradicate all humans. Whether humanitarian intervention is limited to punishment actions and whether humanitarian intervention is limited to cases where there has been explicit UN Security Council authorization for action. Nonetheless, there is general consensus on some of its essential characteristics. And of course, that general consensus is among them, not the general quote-unquote population. In continuation, humanitarian intervention involves the threat and use of military force as a central feature. It is an intervention in the sense that it entails inter interfering in the internal affairs of a state by sending military forces into the territory or airspace of a sovereign state that has not committed an act of aggression against another state. The intervention is in response to situations that do not necessarily pose direct threats to the state's strategic interests, but instead is motivated by humanitarian objectives. So, of course, that's a uh, as they're trying to term it here, human, the UN intervention would in fact be from outside forces. Peacekeeping operation, that they're essentially interfering in the sovereign operations of a particular state by leveraging all of the mechanisms they have there, including the phony law enforcement and the school infrastructure. That's not technically a UN intervention because they're not, quote, they're not technically intervening as they'd say because they already control the area. That's pretty much what they're saying here. Even though one way or the other, you can, uh, I suppose, have both at the same time going on. But most people refer to UN interventions and all this obf obf obfuscation and game playing is to detract from the people trying to go out there and say, watch out for a UN intervention, because then the people are going to say, oh, okay, so I'll be looking for, say, an invasion force coming in. And then they won't even bother to look at the people betraying them amongst in their midst. Customer international law concept of humanitarian intervention dates back to Hugo Grotius, Grotius and European politics in the 17th century. However, that customary law has been superseded by the UN Charter, which prohibits the use of force in international relations, relations subject to two exhaustive exceptions, blah, blah, blah. So they're going to just, you know, the usual propaganda speak uh, nonsense where, you know, they're lying. Finally, the subject of humanitarian intervention has remained a compelling foreign policy issue, especially since NATO's intervention in Kosovo in 1999, as it highlights the tension between the principle of state sovereignty, a defining pillar of the UN system and international law, and evolving international norms related to human rights and the use of force. We don't really need to read the rest of this. This is all just basically filler garbage that means nothing and is all lies, and we know what they're doing, we know who they are, and we know how they've been effective, and it's through the use of children as hostages, spies, and many other heinous acts that are crimes against humanity in general, of course. And the people doing it are traitors to everyone and everything they could possibly betray. Except, of course, for the universalists who have no trouble betraying everything and everyone for the simple, effective application of control. Here also, uh, under UN.org, peacekeeping.un.org, it states military, United Nations peacekeeping, we work alongside UN police and civilian colleagues to promote stability, security, and peace processes. We protect personnel and property. We work with local communities and security forces. So that basically tells you exactly what you need to know. They are the phony police. They are the phony law enforcement. They are the drug dealing gangs. They are all of it. And their particular motive is to protect personnel and property. They have no motive to defend the people of the area. In fact, their motive is to take and steal everything from the people in the area, as they've done everywhere that they have operated in. Leveraging, of course, children for this, for this operation. And they are not coming from some other place. Well, some of them are, I suppose. But most already are, as it were, ready to go. You know, they just need the order, and then they'll march on the people. As it is, anybody who puts on a so-called law enforcement uniform, sheriffs, highway patrol, as they like to be called, state troopers, you know, that doesn't sound military at all, um, municipal police, all of these people when they put that uniform on have decided in their minds that they're perfectly capable with bearing arms against their neighbors 
for any reason to steal their land, to steal their possessions, and to steal their children, and to kill them, or rather, if you're watching this, to kill you. Here we have list of United Nations peacekeeping missions. Here it states UN peacekeepers, soldiers, military officers, police officers, and civilian personnel. Those civilian personnel, of course, would mostly be school faculty. For many countries, monitor and observe peace processes like those documents that we saw before the monitoring of the student behavior and to make sure that they're compliant that emerge in post-conflict situations and assist ex-combatants in implementing the peace agreements they have signed. I don't know what that sounds like to you, but to me that sounds like forced compliance or rather just use of force to inflict occupation of an area. So this language is coming up through the propaganda system to solidify in people's minds and to normalize the idea of UN intervention forces or rather UN peacekeeping operations. This starts with the so-called thin blue line and we're going to notice the similarity in the use of the word blue, the color of their hats and helmets. Thin blue line is a term that typically refers to the concept of the police as a line between law and order and chaos in society. The blue and thin blue line refers to the blue color of the uniforms of many police departments and, of course, the United Nations. So here we have Sid Senator Cindy Friedman. Today, the Massachusetts Senate, and this is from the 1st of January 2024, or the 4th of January, pardon me, of 2024 in Boston. Today, the Massachusetts Senate unanimously passed an act facilitating better interactions between police officers and pers persons with autism spectrum disorder. This is a cover, by the way. Also known as the Blue Envelope Bill. To improve communication during traffic stops involving a person with autism spectrum disorder, and of course to show the papers, as it were, of who is not to be apprehended by the UN occupation forces. Everybody else, of course, is free game, open war, as it were. The bill would create a voluntary program that would make available blue envelopes so that people with autism could carry with them while driving and hand over to a police officer in the event that they are pulled over. A driver could place their license, registration, and insurance cards inside the envelope, and the outside of the envelope would note that the driver has autism spectrum disorder and provide guidance on best practices on how to interact with the individual. Now, of course, this is going to mean that this is the cover for them to get through their own roadblock checkpoints. This is also so that people won't specifically target those carrying blue envelopes, expecting that they are, of course, protected by this occupation force, because they are going to think that anybody carrying one of these envelopes has autism, and that's why they're carrying it. That is how they have run their operations in every country across the planet. The envelope's guidance, which would be created by a coalition of advocates, chiefs of police, and the RMV, as usual, would help law enforcement officers, these are, again, these are enforcing international law on us to better understand the actions of individuals with autism who are more likely to have increased sensitivities and communication challenges in stressful situations. So basically, don't harass the operators in the system, and they're all going to be traveling with these blue envelopes. The blue envelope bill would provide a subtle, yep, that's the idea there, yet meaningful mechanism to ensure that drivers with autism spectrum disorder can remain comfortable and communicate calmly in situations that have the potential to cause significant stress, such as interactions with members of law enforcement during traffic stops. Hmm. So they're expecting, of course, interactions with members of quote-unquote law enforcement to be done during traffic stops, and that they are going to inherently be stressful and potential to cause significant stress. That sounds like they're planning on doing, well, exactly what they've done everywhere, which is a um, implementation of overt, their own overt internationalist martial law crackdown. Said Senator Cindy F. Friedman, D., well, that means a Democrat, Arlington, Vice Chair of the Senate Committee on Ways and Means. This is a simple solution that we have a hardly that will have a hugely beneficial impact on neurodiverse drivers and law enforcement across the Commonwealth. 
course, the best, better thing to do with most of these people is just to hang them from the nearest tree. It just They're just traitors. Plain and simple. This idea comes from the concept of traveling under letters patent. Or traveling under mark. According to Wikipedia, letters patent, plural form for singular and plural. It should actually be... Um, yeah, actually, I think it's always been letters patent. I think it should be letter... Letter patents doesn't quite sound right, so I suppose they always played these games with pluralism, though. Our type of legal instrument in the form of a published written order issued by a monarch, president, or other head of state generally granting an office right monopoly title or status to person or corporation, such as, of course, free passage through vehicle checkpoints. Letters patent can be used for the creation of corporations, government offices to grant city status or coat of arms. Letters patent are also used for the appointment of representatives of the crown, such as governors and governors general of Commonwealth realms, as well as appointing a royal commission in the United Kingdom. They are also issued for the creation of peers of the realm. This, of course, comes from an old idea of the papers, please, is the word, or your papers, please. Your papers, please, or papers, please, is what they use here in Wikipedia, is an expression or trope associated with police state functionaries demanding identification from sitting citizens during random stops or checkpoints. Go figure. It is a cultural metaphor for life in a police state. The phrase was popularized in the first line in the classic 1904 movie, 1942 movie, Casablanca, which depicted life in Viking-controlled Casablanca during World War II. The film opens with the scene of police officers searching a hotel for refugees fleeing from Nazi-controlled territory. The first line of the film is spoken by a police officer to a civilian who stopped on the street. May we see your papers, please. The civilian produces a document, but a second police officer declares that it expired three weeks ago and begins to tell the civilian that he is under arrest. The civilian attempts to flee the police, but a gunshot is heard and the civilian falls to the ground. So, yes, of course, that's naturally what they want to do here, and uh, it's going to be peacekeeping, right? That's what they're doing. Keeping the peace by killing everybody that's not part of their organization, as usual. And now we see more patterns of this elevation of the blue idea from the thin blue line and the association of phony law enforcement with UN peacekeeping operations. DNC announces new program Team Blue. In partnership with organizations including Swing Left, 270 Strategies, Obama Alumni Association, Hillary Alumni Group, Bernie Alumni, Sister District, Flippable, and Mobilize America. And naturally there's no individuals there because they don't give an absolute rat's ass about individuals or individual human beings. All they care about is control and their phony, juridic, fictional entities. Here it states, Democrats are seeing increased enthusiasm all across the country with a record number of volunteers wanting to get involved in campaigns in an effort to help direct this enthusiasm and get people plugged into campaigns up and down the ballot. Today, the DNC is launching a new volunteer program called Team Blue. Team Blue will support campaigns on the ground efforts by making it easier for people to identify or to find volunteer opportunities that work with their schedule or to identify a campaign where they could spend weeks or months volunteering full time during the final stretch. That's, of course, part of the support element. Additionally, Team Blue is partnering with 270 Strategies and Swing Left on a new initiative called the GOTV Deployment Project. Hmm. What does GOTV Deployment Project sound like? Which is working with campaigns to identify their needs and then matching and deploying experienced and diverse campaign talent to key up races and down the, up and down the ballot, including the Swing Left's targeted congressional campaign. The GOTV deployment project will maximize voter contact and other GOTV activities done by volunteers, including knocking on doors and making calls during the final weeks and last weekend before November 6th. And I guarantee that's going to relate somehow to, well, nowadays, of course, this is from 2018. Nowadays, I'm sure all of this stuff was code for impose UN occupation, declare martial law, or UN peacekeeping efforts. Here also we have PAC Profile, the Blue Initiative, Open Secrets Following the Money in Politics. This PAC, the Blue Initiative, formed out of Lima, Ohio, 45801, that's the uh, zip code. Industry, Democrat, Liberal, uh, Treasurer, Aaron Dickerson, and then there's an FEC Committee ID number. Also, we have Act Blue. I'm sure many have heard about that. It's a nonprofit American fundraising platform and political action committee pack founded in 2004. Act Blue builds tech 
technology and infrastructure to be used by democratic campaigns and of course the United Nations and has been described as a center of a transformation in how political campaigns work. It is focused on mobilizing small dollar donors and as of June 2024 has raised 13.7 billion for left-leaning and democratic candidates and causes since it was established. Notice of course the word there, causes. ActBlue is organized as a PAC but it serves as a conduit for processing individual compromise contributions made through the platform. Under federal law, these contributions are made by individuals that are not considered PAC donations. So that's just, of course, yet another one of these mechanisms that will help to fund the um, United Nations peacekeeping occupation. Now we have, of course, Red the Blue. And this is what the whole idea of getting the Patriot Movement to quote unquote back the blue is about. The key to expanding our democratic majority is right here. With diverse candidates like those below, Red to Blue is a highly competitive and tested program at the DCCC yikes, that equips top-tier candidates with organizational and fundraising support to help them continue to run strong campaigns. Come November, these candidates and others will take on Republicans across the country and fight to help us win back our majority. Of course, they mean literally fight. Now, the important thing to note here is that this, just like with the school system, this is all cover. And when you really research through these mechanisms, you find out that it is all cover and that everything that they're claiming to be doing, that's not their actual purpose. It's not their ultimate objective. They always have ulterior motives, especially when they're talking in code. We also have blue action. Stop the spread of the extremist MAGA agenda. Spread the hope to your fellow Texas Democrats. Texas Blue Action volunteers are committed to long-term organizing to bring change to their communities. Texas Blue Action is the largest year-round volunteer re relational organization network in the United States. And of course, as from my experience of most of my life volunteering in politics, I know that the Republicans and Democrats are simply two sides, two faces of the same coin. Now, as usual, we also have a relation to Case Blue was the Vermox plan for the 1942 strategic summer offensive in southern Russia between 28th of June and 24 of November 1942 during World War II. The objective was to capture the oil fields of Baku, Grozny, and Maykop for two purposes, to enable the Germans to resupply their oil fuel stock and also to deny their use to the Soviet Union, thereby bringing about the complete collapse of the Soviet war effort. Of course, as we all know, the Soviet Union eventually was became a superpower. They were not actually defeated. However, it is interesting, I find, how many associations there are with the so-called law enforcement, the United Nations, and Nazi Germany. Finally, we are going to look at the catalyst. As with all of these events, they need a reason. They need a pretext to impose what they are already planning. It's very simple. Not only do they have to build up the imposition of force through all of the blue related things about the blue uniform, the actual force mechanism. They also need to build up a support structure, which we saw with the multi-tiered support systems, right? Not one system, many systems. Now they also have to build up to the catalyst. That's what we're going to look at here. According to Wikipedia, active shooter, uh, an active shooter is the perpetrator of an ongoing mass shooting. The term is primarily used to characterize shooters who are targeting victims indiscriminately and at a large scale, which oftentimes will either commit suicide or intend to be killed by police. And of course, a lot of these, as we know, are false flags. They don't need to be real, but they're certainly reported as real pretty much everywhere. And you're not allowed to question it. So that should be, in fact, a big marker of what they plan to do here. Active shooters intentionally use form the pretext for the seizure of firearms from the local population so that they can better implement control mechanisms of their peacekeeping operations. So, further results under Google, we have FBI releases 2023 active shooter incidents in the United States. Active shooter incidents jumped more than 50% last year, and this is from 2022. Uh, active shooter safety resources, and the U.S. in 2022 saw the highest number of active shooters. So those are your headlines. Notice, of course, you have FBI 1 and 2. Well, first one's FBI, second one's CNN, third one's FBI, and the fourth one's CNN. That's not result manipulation, and I don't know what is. Then, of course, we have the FBI, active shooter incidents in the United States in 2021. The FBI has designated 61 shooters in 2021 as active shooter incidents. Well, 
you know, of course, they can designate it wherever the hell they want. Doesn't mean that it's actually true. And this has what's an active shooter. That's the same thing we read, of course, in Wikipedia. And how many active shooter incidents are there? That's the federal data. And uh, most of the stuff is, of course, going to just be the same organizational structure, just lying about what's really going on. And then we have how often do police stop active shooters? This is from New York Times. A review of 433 active shooter attackers reveals that most are over before the police arrive. Now, of course, naturally, they make these things up. But all of the other results that we saw were either FBI or CNN, and now we've got New York Times, NBC News, and CBS News. So, And that's much farther down on the results list. And then this one says in 2021 there were 61 active shooter incidents. And then this one down here, CBS News, says that active shooters in America killed or injured 313 individuals across the country in 2022. Now, if you Google active shooters in 2024, you get extremely different results. Essentially speaking, none of the results that we saw from simply looking up active shooters. List of mass shootings in the United States in 2024 is a whole separate Wikipedia article. There is a list of mass shootings that took place in the United States in 2024. Mass shootings are incidents in which several people are injured or killed due to firearm-related violence. Specifically, for the purposes of this article, a total of four more victims. As of August 31st, a total of 527 people have been killed. Hmm. Seems like they're attempting to multiply the uh, implications of these events. And now we've got the Gun Violence Archive. Oh, look at that. They have mass shootings in 2024. Huh, go figure. Active shooter safety resources, options for consideration, active shooter training video. 17 upcoming shooters of 2024 and beyond. Active shooter emergency action plan. And of course, as you know, it is all of these things, the images, you have crime scene tape on the first video. You have some guy and a woman, possibly a young child, hard to tell. Second video. Third video is a dark area at night overlooking trees with a moon. And then the fourth has, of course, the red and blue usual colors of so-called law enforcement. Whether they're sheriffs, uh, agents, and highway patrol, doesn't matter. They all use the same color spectrum. But the focus, of course, is on the color blue, <clears throat> as with the United Nations. Now, naturally, when you look at these videos here, if you don't read the headlines, or if you do read the headlines, there's a bunch of patterns there. And there usually are when it comes to search results. But it's all sort of evidence of their operational ramping up plans. And whether it's true or not is of little consequence because they will make it true by ensuring that there's no, as it were, um, contrary voices, right? It will be true because they say so. And if you say it's not true, then you're going to die. That's essentially how it runs. Now, of course, uh, we have the FBI twice and CNN and then the Washington Post. There have been 22 mass shootings in 2024, apparently. Um, and then the next one that has 2024 in the title is CNN. How many mass shootings in 2024 is the headline. Now, how many mass shootings were there in 2024? This states 49 mass shootings. And that's from WSF.org out of Florida, apparently. And then, of course, CNN again and the Gun Violence Archive with their long list of fake events that they just simply add a whole database of them and say, look how many they are. And you say, well, all those are fake. They don't add up. And they say, well, we're going to go ahead and um, take your child away from you. Take all your money. Make it so you can't live, and then we're going to find an excuse to kill you. Now, as far as the messaging goes, in relation to this Catalyst event specifically, we find very many indicators in pattern. Now, the strongest one of all of them is the odd title for tractor pull events. Tractor pull 2021, Pro Stock Tractors, Dragway 42, OSTPA Spring Shootout, West Salem, Ohio. Tractor Pulling 2021 Southern VA Winter Classic 5,500 pound two-cylinder tractor shootout at Chatham. 
4.1 Lime Pro Stock Shootout Tractor the tractor at Holzhauer's Nashville, Illinois, September 2020 Tractor Pull Tractor Pulling Incident and National Tractor Pulling Championship in Bowling Green, Ohio, Ohio 2022 Now, if you look up, of course, the Tractor Pull Association you'll find that uh, there's a lot of activity and uh, a lot of uh, built-up messaging around these events here in um, Wikipedia under 24 of August 2024 we have the Mount Pleasant shootout truck and tractor pull Fairfield County Fair Mount Pleasant shootout truck truck and tractor pull date August 24 2024 <clears throat> now it's more than likely that these are the places they actually uh, um, plan the events I'm not of course saying that they are going to essentially do the events here but it does appear that across the board with the um, the ramping up of activities that there's going to be a lot of events happening simultaneously around the country that are being uh, essentially uh, built up to. And that's what the evidence of communication patterns suggests. Show me shoot at Warrensburg, Missouri. And uh, <clears throat> that doesn't specifically state it's about tractor poles, but I guarantee that it is. That's from July 20th, 2024. 2024 NTPA event schedule. It's a tractor pull. And uh, Dragway 42 NTPA fall shootout truck and tractor Facebook. And of course, that's from September 25th, 2021. So, yes, these things have been going on a while. This is not exactly a new thing, but the... A re repetition of the pattern is suspect. <laughs>